something I've been working in for, for a little while now. Um, there was a little bit of discussion about it yesterday in, in some of the discussion sessions and on the chat and there was lots of questions so I'm hoping maybe by the end of this talk you might have some tools that you can take away with you for estimating the full observation error covariance matrix. And just before I start I would also like to thank um, my collaborators um, from the University of Reading where some of this work was done um, and at the Met Office. Um, the main ones are listed here but I've had many useful conversations with many people, some who are in this virtual room with us so thank you to everybody who has helped. Um, so I don't know if I really need to explain why we want to um, fill up our R matrix, but um, just a reminder that in data assimilation, the observation error statistics don't just consist of that instrument error associated with our measuring instrument, but also with a net representation error, um, which exists because our model and our observations have different spatial and temporal scales, because we have observation operators, which might be um, approximated, um, and because we do a lot of processing to our observations. And because of all of those um, sources of uncertainty, there's um, a dependence on the, the state of the geophysical system. And this representation error can often be correlated um, between different observation errors. But we ignore these correlations. It's been very common in atmospheric assimilation, MWP, ocean assimilation, land age assimilation, to, ig to ignore these correlated observation errors and assume that our R matrix, our observation error covariance matrix, is diagonal. We do this for primarily for two reasons, because a diagonal R is quick and easy to invert, so it's good for computational speed and efficiency, and also because we just don't know what these observation error correlations are. And so to, 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 yeah, to satisfy this assumption, um, we often inflate our observation error variances or thin our data, and there's just an example on the right there of the processing and thinning we do to Doppler wind observations. And because of this, we lose a huge number of the observations that we have available to us, but even those ones that we do assimilate, we don't extract all the information that we can from them. So I said there were two challenges, and one of them is a quantifying the uncertainty, and there's been a lot of work over the last five years to quantify some of these um, observation uncertainties for different um, instruments, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, all of these examples that I've got on this slide, but just to show you that there is an array of work that's been going on. We have these um, kind of checkerboard correlation matrices the interchannel matrices for the satellite data and then we've got some spatial correlations for severe EMVs, Doppler winds um, and even temporal correlations for zenith total delay so we can quantify this uncertainty I'm going to talk a bit about how we can do that later on and the other challenge is actually using a full R matrix it is more computationally costly we will never get away from that um, but it is possible for small data sets such as the interchannel correlations and that's really where this work started um, but also we can do something called matrix reconditioning, which re uh, reduces the condition number of a matrix. And that has also begun to help with using the full R matrix. Now, spatial correlations kind of also pose a different problem. And that's because often we have um, observations distributed across different processes. So there's a little example or schematic up here where we normally split these green dots into four different um, across four different processes. And that would mean if those observations have correlated errors, we'd need a lot of communication. But there's also some new solutions emerging here, and I'm just going to highlight what they are, not going into detail of what they are. And one of them is to treat families of observations where we group subsets, such as these green observations, and we'd send them to a single processor. Um, the other method that's um, also emerging, I should say this one's currently now operation operational in the Met Office system uh, for Doppler radar winds. Um, and then another method that's um, emerging is this um, solving a diffusion equation on a finite element mesh to give you a representation of the inverse R matrix. So we don't have to do any inversion there. Um, and this isn't yet operational, but it, it's a neat technique developed um, by or used originally in the ocean assimilation, but it's been pushed for atmospheric assimilation um, by Guiyal. But I should say technical challenges in using a full R matrix definitely still exist. And this is not a problem that has been solved because although we can use interchannel correlations and there are now methods for spatial correlations, if we want to try and use both at the same time, neither of these suggestions for spatial correlations are really working. So there's definitely a, um, a lot of work to be done there. But why are we persevering? 
well, there's a lot to be gained from using a full error covariance matrix. So I've got some figures from some, from some papers uh, ranging across the last 10 years. So this one's an example on um, this one on the left is an example of how we can um, reduce analysis error by incorporating a full R matrix so it's from Stuart et al where um, for the shallow water equations, the gray line is what happens when we just assume our R is diagonal. We have this large analysis error across the domain at a single time. Whereas if we include the full R matrix, we can reduce that analysis error. Another thing we can do by using a full error covariance matrix is to um, improve our forecast skill. And so this is a plot from uh, Western at L2014, which shows that when we assimilate um, a correlated ERZ matrix, and um, we have an, a, a better fit to all of these verification metrics or an improvement in all these verification metrics, almost across the board. There's a few little negative impacts. Um, and then the other thing that we gain from using a Falera covariance matrix is small scale information. Um, so on the right here, we have four different or oh, three forecasts and one um, radar plot. So this is the radar plot and this panel B is what was at the time the um, Met Office UK forecast for rainfall. And we see that in this forecast, we don't really capture much small scale information. And here R was uncorrelated. But when we include correlations in our R matrix, that's both these bottom panels, firstly, where we have observations every six kilometers and then every three kilometers, we start to get some of this small scale structure in the rainfall and, and this panel in particular where we can assimilate more observations with a correlated error is starting to fit better the observations but we have to be able to fulfill our R matrix so how do we estimate those observation uncertainties well, there's quite a lot of methods about um, I'm not going to talk about them all I'm just going to mention the three most popular and go into more detail about one of them so I've got the three most popular listed here. And the first is this kind of metrological approach. Um, now, don't be put off by all the equations on the right, but that's essentially what the metrological approach is. We build a traceable uncertainty budget using uncertainty propagation through all the processing the observation can possibly go through, right from what might affect the actual sensor that's taking the measurement to um, any averaging we might do to the observations. And this is just an example of all the equations for um, Sentinel-3. And as you can see, it's quite complex, but if we can do this, it's really great because we can have a full accurate uncertainty estimation, but it is, as you can probably guess, very complex and quite time consuming. And for that reason, this methodology has typically been used for climatological approaches and um, kind of continuous um, data records. Um, and the other thing to be wary with this method is that if someone passes you a uncertainty budget to use in your assimilation, that's excellent. It's really great information. But don't forget that when you're doing your assimilation, you're going to be comparing to your model and the representation uncertainty that's generated at that interface of the observation and your model might not be included in the uncertainty budget. So um, another popular method has been triple co-location. And this is where, as the method suggests, you have three sets of data. In my schematic, I've happened to pick in situ satellite and model data, but it could be three in situ if you're lucky enough. Um, and you use these three sets of data um, to provide an objective characteristic of the biases and random errors related to your data. And it's good because it gives you the potential to segregate the sources of error in each of your data sets but it does require these three independent co-located data sets, which are often hard to come by. And if they're not fully co-located, then you have additional representation uncertainty that needs to be accounted for. But recently, the thing that's been most popular are residual based methods. Um, and these are, are great because they make use of byproducts of the data assimilation scheme. So it's information you already have to hand. So there's these three residuals, the background residual, observation minus the background in observation space. For simplicity, I'm just going to say background. Um, the analysis residual, observation minus analysis, and then you have the, the analysis minus background residual. You can summarize these on this um, geometric representation of all of this of these innovations. Now, I haven't even told you how we use them, but before we start, the pros and cons of these residual-based methods in general is that 
they are easy to use, easy to implement and make use of data that we already have. And that is why they have been so popular. But we do have to collect data, lots of samples of data. And typically to do this, we need to collect data over space and data over time. And therefore we have to make an assumption that our um, observation error statistics aren't going to be changing rapidly. Now you can segregate your um, statistical samples if you have enough, but it's, it is mostly about quantity. So there's kind of two main um, methods with these residuals. And the first, sorry, the T should be a superscript there, is the Hollingsworth Lomberg method. Um, and this just uses information from the innovation, so the um, observation minus background. And um, so it's really good because you don't have to run the assimilation. And what we do is we take the um, statistical um, mean of the outer product of these innovations to get the innovation error covariance. So this is the sum of our observation error covariance and our background error covariance in observation space. So, but then we need to separate these. And this is where this method becomes a little bit more subjective is because typically to separate the contributions between the background and observation, um, you fit a function. So for example, you'll do your um, statistical calculation and you'll end up with something that looks like these yellow bars. You'll have like a, an estimated um, uncertainty, but you fit a correlation function to this. And typically this is done by saying, well, my background error has or oh, background error uncertainties have correlations, so we'll fit this blue line, and the remaining are is this uncorrelated portion. But if we know we think R should have correlations, then this fit is a poor choice. And so actually, it's quite difficult to estimate R using the hollandsworth lomberg unless you have a really good estimate of your HBH transpose, um, because any length scale or, or um, function shape that you choose here will influence your retrieved statistics. And that difficulty in separation is why this ne next set of metrics has become so popular. So these are the de Rosier et al diagnostics, and they can be used to separate um, this in innovation covariance into its different constituent parts, and also give you um, some information about the analysis error covariance matrix. Um, I'm only gonna focus on the, the R equation, but what I'm gonna say does apply to, to all three of these. And essentially the only difference here from the hollingsworth longberg is that rather than just the innovation um, O minus B in here, we have O minus A and O minus B. Um, but the main assumption that goes into these diagnostics is that the exact error covariance matrices B and R have been used in the assimilation. And we know that's not true because we know we don't know the correct B and R. So in fact, this equation becomes, if we have these uh, non-exact matrices with the tildes over them, we have um, this equation instead, and you see it doesn't quite cancel out to be the nice R matrix that you would like. So there's a few things we can do about this. We can compare this methodology to other methodologies for the same data set, and there's been a few minutes. couple of um, studies, thank you, that have um, shown that you can get qualitatively similar results. You can iterate the diagnostic, but also there's been a lot of theoretical work to try and understand what goes on, because there's such easy diagnostics to implement people have really wanted to understand the results they give. So I'm just going to give a couple of examples of those. By no means is this a complete um, delve into the theory that exists, but, but there's a lot there to help you unpick and untangle what these diagnostics give you. And um, so one of the first things we do is we tend to inflate our observation error variances because we don't know what the correlations are. And in that case, it's quite likely that the diagnostics will give an overestimated observation error variance. So that's one thing to be aware of. Another thing we do is neglect correlations in R in the assimilation. So here in this plot, um, if the dark blue is our true correlation and the green is our estimated, uh, sorry, our assumed correlation, then we'll recover this estimated correlation, which has lo uh, shorter length scales than expected. And that is something that happens all the time. So if we're neglecting our correlations in R, the diagnostic is likely to underestimate correlation length scale. So another way in, of how to interpret our results. I mentioned we can iterate the diagnostic. So this is some work from Gautier et al, who show that um, if your B is not well specified, you will never converge to the right R matrix using the diagnostic. So here this dashed line is your, your starting point, you iterate and you get this black line. We've never quite reached the truth in the red line. 
Um, like I said, I haven't mentioned all of them, but I'll cover some of the other theoretical results here. So the good thing about this method is it returns the full R matrix and other covariances. These theoretical studies can help us untangle our results that we get. We can iterate to get improved outcomes. And one thing I didn't mention is that we can also um, gain information content on our, from our observations using these diagnostics. But it does require the observation to be actively assimilated. And there is this assumption that the error statistics are correct in our assimilation. And I haven't gone into detail why, but it's hard to apply these um, diagnostics to assimilation schemes using localization. Um, yeah, so just to summarize, using a full R um, is really beneficial for the assimilation. There are several methods to exist for estimating these uncertainties, each with different benefits and limitations. Most popular are these residual based methods, but you have to use them with caution. Using multiple methods can help provide confidence in our result. And just going back to the beginning, once you've got your full R matrix, there are some circumstances where it can use, though it's still technically challenging. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>